need no introduction at all. We've partnered together in the gospel for some 30 years together. For some of you that are new, this is the sending church for the Pate Fields, and we delight in them. It's one of those things where um, missions is my, just beats in my chest. Uh, missionaries are my heroes, and um, I, I think top of the list is the Pate Fields, and I'm so grateful to have them here today. I'm so grateful to have them uh, be, be our representatives to Brazil, and I'm so thankful for their ministry down through the years. Uh, they're going to come and sing for us a special, and then Nathan is going to preach for us. So looking forward to it. You guys come. Luke chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to read the first 11 verse. Some of you probably read this in the middle of the week or at the end of the week. Um, we'll read it again just to make sure we have um, the story in our heads before we kind of dive in here and, and study this a little bit. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not Luke. This moment when Jesus walks into the life of Peter and these other men and they don't know what's happening. They don't know what's coming up. They don't know what wonderful future God has planned for them. And this is the moment when things change. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that there, there are moments in all of our lives when, when you and all of your goodness and your grace, first of all, show up in our lives to save us from sin, uh, to transport us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the light of your love. And then there are other moments when you walk in to, to change the direction of our lives and to point us to what you want to do with our lives. Um, and we're just so thankful, Lord, that you use us at all, that you give us the privilege of walking with you, cooperating with you in the great grand work that you are doing in the world. I pray this morning, Lord, that your spirit would encounter open minds, open ears, sensitive hearts, um, that he would have freedom to take this passage that he inspired and apply it to our lives this morning, and, and that uh, your will might be done here this morning as it is in heaven. We thank you in advance for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, crossroads um, in life often appear unannounced. Uh, something happens, uh, a decision is made, and suddenly life as we know it changes forever. Um, I'm just thinking in scripture, Joseph was on a fact-finding mission for his dad. He didn't know, when he saw his brothers up there, he didn't know that in a few short hours he would be thrown into a pit, later on sold into slavery, and life as Joseph knew it was never the same again. David, the youngest of his family, is out watching sheep, and he doesn't know that Samuel showed up at dad's house, and that in a few short hours he's going to be anointed the future king of Israel, and life as David knows it is done. 
not in a bad way, but in, a, in, a, in one day, everything shifts. And all of a sudden, you know, it, he's launched into those years of running from Saul. And I mean, just years before he's actually sitting on the throne. But it's this day that was just a normal day, you know, out there tending the sheep and, and, and everything changes. And, and from the world's perspective, these kind of moments are, people would say, well, that's just a twist of fate. That's just, you know, something that's unfortunate. It's what happens in the world, you know. Life is just full of those kind of things. But we understand from scriptures that all of this is controlled by a sovereign God. There, there's just not any accidents. These moments are uh, planned by him, orchestrated by him. We don't always understand them, um, but we, we trust, we who are, are saved and part of the family of God, trust in a good sovereign God who only does good to his people. And that's kind of what, what we have here is, is this transforming moment in the life of a fisherman called Simon Peter. And, and it's the moment when Jesus walks into his life and changes it forever. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus and Peter have met. Because earlier in Luke... Jesus spends the night at Peter's house and, and uh, heals his mother-in-law. And Matthew and Mark seem to indicate that there had been other encounters on the beach with Jesus and, or, or with Peter and his colleagues. So this is not the first time that Jesus and Peter are meeting, but this encounter is life-changing. From this point on, Peter's life is never the same again. But what really struck me coming through this passage uh, this time and just kind of throwing myself into it, trying to imagine myself in this passage, is that the beginning of this day was completely normal. And that's part of what makes it so shocking not, and, and wonderful, is that, you know, Peter and James and John, at the beginning of this, are doing what fishermen do. You know, they were out, they fished all night, they didn't catch anything. Uh, they dragged their boats and, and nets up on the beach, and they're mending their nets. It's just a very uh, humdrum, normal, everyday scene uh, of what's going on, and they're probably listening, you know, to the waves of the lake, you know, uh, kind of lap up there on the beach, and they're maybe a little tired and maybe a little frustrated because they don't have anything to show for their night's work. And then all of a sudden, they start to hear this hubbub, this, this, this noise of a crowd, and, and this crowd appears, and, and, and they're kind of pressing in on, on an individual because and, and in, and, they don't want to miss anything that this, this man has to say, and they, they, they clamor, to, to hear him, and, and so he, this man is looking about for some place to sit, and he sees a boat. He sees Peter's boat, and he jumps into it, and he asks Peter, you know, shove me out so I can preach. And of course, we know the man is Jesus, and Peter does what he says. But it's kind of a funny scene. Have you ever, can you see Peter, you know, uh, when Jesus jumps into him, he's probably startled, you know, and Jesus doesn't ask permission. We'll get to that in a second. He just says, shove me out. You know? Now, Jesus is, is here to speak to the people. That's plain. There's a big crowd. We can't forget that. There's always this crowd there. And he uh, preaches to them. But it's the, the focus of this passage is really on the exchange between Jesus and Peter. James and John are going to follow, too, at the end. But the, the, the focus here uh, of Jesus' attention is on... Uh, changing the direction of Peter's life. And I want to note a couple things, how Jesus progresses through this. It's very interesting to note what Jesus wants. In the first three verses, you can see that Jesus wants to use Peter's professional equipment. There are two boats pulled up on the beach, and Jesus chooses Peter's for a pulpit. Uh, now, I don't know how you would feel, but, you know, if... If, if somebody jumped into your boat, if, if, how many of you have a boat? You have people here have a boat? Okay, so some of you can imagine. You have a boat. And if some, somebody that you don't know very well just walks in and jumps on the boat and tells you to do something with it, what would your reaction be? Yeah, it's kind of like, um, hey, get out of my boat. And why? Because that boat is yours. It's your boat. You can tell people to do uh, with your things what you want to tell them, right? And so it would be very natural for Peter to, to say to anybody who jumps into his boat, hey, get out of my boat. This is my boat. It might even have his wife's name painted on the side of it. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. 
But maybe it was, you know? It's, and think about it. This is not a pleasure boat. This is Peter's, this is his livelihood here. Because sometimes we have boats just for fun. This is not just for fun. This is what his life is based on. It's a very important piece of equipment uh, to Peter. All of what he does and in terms of supporting his family is based on this boat. But now Jesus calmly enters the boat as if he owns it. And as the Lord of creation, doesn't he? Doesn't he own the boat? He doesn't have to ask permission. Now, Peter doesn't understand this yet. Peter doesn't know who Jesus is yet. So I can only imagine, I love to imagine things, you know, the kind of look on Peter's face when Jesus just steps in there. And what he's doing, at least what I understand, what, what Peter or what Jesus is doing here is he's testing Peter. He wants Peter to realize that he's not just another man. And that he does have the right to use Peter's things for his purposes. Jesus wants Peter to submit his things, his most important and precious things, for him to use. Because really, if a man won't submit his things for the Lord's use, he's probably not going to submit himself for the Lord's use. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a test. Because if you're not willing to give your stuff to the Lord, you're probably not going to give yourself to the Lord. Later on in ministry, Jesus is going to encounter a rich young man. You know, he says, I want eternal life. And, and Jesus said, well, you need to keep the commandments. And here are the commandments you need to keep. And he said, I've kept all those since I was a kid, which is probably a dubious claim. But Jesus plays along with it. And he says, okay, one thing. You just lack one thing. Sell everything you have and distribute it to the poor. And you'll have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. In other words, Jesus says, I want access to what's most precious to you. I want your stuff. I want you to submit your things for me to use as I please. And in this case, I want you to give it all away. And tragic, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those tragic scenes in Scripture where the young ruler just says, you know, that's, that's a little bit too much. I'm not willing to do that. And since he won't submit his possessions, he won't submit himself. And he walks away. And we never know. It's one of those passages where it's like, could I have another couple verses <laughs> to know, did this guy ever come back? Was there another encounter between him and Jesus? I don't know. I hope so. And I hope on the second time, you know, he didn't let his stuff get in the way. But it's interesting to me that, that Jesus uh, makes this test to Peter. He doesn't say it, Peter, I want your stuff. It's just kind of an attitude he takes by jumping in the boat and telling Peter what to do with it. So what about us? How about you? How about your stuff? How about your things? If Jesus wants your car, if he wants your boat, if he wants your computer, I don't know what it is that's most important to you stuff-wise, things-wise. Uh, are those things available for the Lord to use as he pleases? Or do we take the attitude like, okay, Lord, you know, this is yours. You can do with this as you want, but this over here is hands off. This is my stuff. And I want to call the shots on it. If you're resistant in recognizing that all you have has been given to you by God, and if you're resistant to use uh, his use of it in any way that he pleases, then you're probably going to resist when he calls you personally. It's kind of a test to see where you are in your relationship to God and in relationship to the Lord Jesus and, and the right that he has to everything, to everything. It's a good test. If you're resistant to him on, on this point, then you're probably going to be more resistant when he starts talking about you as a person. So Jesus begins his work here with Peter wanting the use of Peter's things, but he doesn't stop there. Uh, he moves on and, 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 and demonstrates that he doesn't want Peter's professional expertise. He wants Peter's obedience. In verses 4 through 7. This is where he tells Peter to launch out into the deep and go fishing. After Peter's just spent 12 hours fishing and doesn't have anything to show for it. Now, Scripture doesn't record Peter's thoughts here. But you can imagine what they might have been. At least I can. How would you feel if someone completely outside of your profession walked into your workplace 
and told you what to do. You know? And, and what they tell you to do runs totally counter to all of the years of experience that you have in that particular job. You know, as, as eloquent and as different as Jesus is, what is he by trade? He's a carpenter. Peter, in his mind, not, this is not scripture, this is me imagining. Peter could be thinking, he's a carpenter. <laughs> I'm a fisherman. I know that fish here you catch at night. We just tried that. Didn't work. And Jesus is telling me to go back out and spend some more time. And I'm thinking, too, that there's still a crowd there, probably. And so he's kind of put in this place where Jesus has put him on the spot. I'm telling you to go back out. And James and John are kind of like, oh, what's Peter going to do? You know, he just spent the night out there. So he... In my, again, this is not scripture, but I'm feeling a little peer pressure here. Am I going to do what's, you know, go with my conventional wisdom, my professional expertise here? Or am I going to do something that's totally wacky, that totally, doesn't make sense to me, be, simply because this man is telling me to do it, simply because Jesus is telling me I should do it? You know, Peter makes a big mistake here. Part of it is, again, Peter doesn't know all that he's going to know about Jesus uh, down the way. What Peter doesn't realize is that Jesus is the creator of fish. Jesus doesn't need nets or boats. If Jesus wants to, he can say, hey, all of you fish, jump up on the beach. Peter doesn't know that. But the fish in that lake are going to rise to the surface and they're going to plunge to the depth at his will. Well, whatever his thoughts, or whatever I'm thinking his thoughts were, uh, Peter's got a choice to make. You know, what Jesus is telling him to do runs counter to his professional expertise. Jesus is testing him once again. He says, I'm not concerned, not, not that professional expertise is bad, but there are times when God comes in above all that and says, I want you to do something that runs counter to, because my wisdom is greater. And I want you just to obey. And Peter, Peter's really honest here. He voices his, his skepticism. He says, Master, we've, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. You know, emphasis on the word Nothing. But I'm so glad that skepticism doesn't rule the day here. And he, and he continues and says, nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to let down the net. That doesn't make any sense to me because you're commanding it. I'm going to do it. Your word is more important than my expertise. So Peter steps out in faith doing what doesn't make sense to him, what run, runs counter to what he's thinking. And of course, we know what the results are, is that they catch so much fish. And this must have been like way above what even a good catch would have been because when we get down to uh, verse 9, it says, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish. Well, I mean, these guys have been fishing for years, so they've seen big catches. So this must have been way above normal, something so unusual that all of them are saying, this is not normal. You know, this is something miraculous that's going on here. And there's so many fish that he has to call James and John over, and they're filling the boats, and they're sinking. But it's because Peter's willing, at this point, to put aside his, his professional expertise and say, okay, I'll go with what you're asking me to do, commanding me to do, even though it doesn't make sense to me. And we can look at admiration upon Peter, but what if Jesus came to us with a similar request? What if, what if you have spent years training for a certain occupation what if you've worked your way up the ladder and you're where you have always wanted to be? Which isn't necessarily bad. There's nothing sinful about what Peter's doing here. He's a fisherman. He's an excellent fisherman, probably. But, but what if Jesus were to do that and then come into your life and command you to do something which makes no professional sense? How would you respond? Would you play it safe and conclude that that Jesus wouldn't possibly ask you to do something that crazy? No, this must be some voice. I'm not, I'm not understanding this. Uh, you know, I think I'll just play it safe here. 
Or, or will you be like Peter and say, nevertheless, it's your word, I'll do it. It doesn't make sense to me, but because you're ordering it, Lord, I will obey. You know, there's going to be a lot of people at my workplace, maybe even at church, they're going to look at me and say, you're crazy. You're crazy. But I know I've heard the Lord's voice. There's no doubt. I mean, Peter knows that Jesus has spoken to him, so there's no doubt here. And he just moves forward in obedience. But of course, you know, Jesus, this is not ultimately what Jesus is after. It's another step towards the final goal, which is he wants Peter. And he wants Peter to leave his profession in order to serve. He wants to abandon everything he knows and dedicate himself to serving the Lord as one of his in intimate disciples. It's interesting to me that, that, you know, as Peter looks at this miraculous catch, his response is a confession that he's a sinful man. He, he throws himself down at Jesus' feet and declares, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And perhaps, perhaps he's feeling the general weight of all of his sin in, in the presence of the Son of God. And again, I don't think that Peter at this point understands everything he's going to understand about Jesus, but he's understanding something. Or perhaps he's confessing the sins of the moment, maybe thoughts that passed through his mind when Jesus commanded him to fish, and maybe he felt a little bit of superiority, like, what does this guy know about fishing? That's what I think. I, I can imagine those kind of thoughts. He would never say that. But in his mind, you know, what's this guy have to do with fishing, you know? And then when he sees what happens, all of a sudden he's just struck with, oh, man, I can't believe I thought that. So glad I didn't say anything. But I'm, to even think it is sinful. Whatever, whatever it is, Peter recognizes that Jesus is right and that he is wrong, and he bows himself before the master. And then Jesus looks at Peter and he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. You might say, well, of what would Peter be afraid? Well, of, of leaving everything he knows to head into the unknown. Of leaving a profession in which he is capable and experienced to be a novice disciple following Jesus. And Jesus is aware of this, and he says, don't be afraid, Peter. I'm calling you to be a fisher of men. And why, how, why can Jesus say this, don't be afraid? Well, it's because the one who's calling him is going to walk beside him. And he's going to teach him everything he needs to know. You know, on another occasion when Jesus called Peter and his friends, he declared, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That has been a great comfort to me through the years in the sense that I can't make myself a fisher of men. All that Jesus says is, you follow me, I'm going to make you whatever it is I want to make you. In your case, it's a fisher of men. Just obey me, just follow me, and I'll transform you into fishers of men. He would make them what he wanted them to be. His, Peter's responsibility, James' responsibility, John's responsibility is just to follow. Follow close behind the Lord. And that's amazingly... I mean, to me, this is just astounding. In verse, the last verse, or 11, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. There's, Luke doesn't record anything here like Peter saying, hey, you know, could I have like a month to talk about this with my wife and pray about it and get back with you? No, Jesus is saying, now, you have to follow me now. It's a now moment. This isn't, there are times when we, I mean, in our case, like we're praying about what does God want us to do, but there are moments when God says move, and you know God means now. It's not, there's no doubt in your mind. And it's just amazing to me that Peter does it, just walks away from everything he knows, and life as Peter knew it changes forever. But wow, what is Peter going to be later on, you know? Leader of the church, writer of two books of the Bible, at least, you know, maybe contributed to some others. Peter didn't know that at this point. But what plans? Otherwise, if Peter, at, at this moment, in verse, in, in this chapter, if Peter had said, you know, I don't think so. 
What would Peter be? An obscure fisherman in Israel that we would never read about again. He just recede back into history and wouldn't be the wonderful. He's one of the disciples that I most love to identify with because he's so like us, you know. Well, you know, when we think of, you know, this is, this is a call to ministry for, for Peter. And when we think of people being called to ministry, through the years when I've traveled and preached in services like this, I often focus, and I think we generally focus on young people, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think young people need to be challenged, and they need to be uh, informed about the joys of serving the Lord in full-time ministry. Uh, and so we come to, you know, people haven't chosen a path of life yet, and, and they're not experiencing any profession, and, you know, they're just kind of wondering, what am I going to do with my life? And we bring this kind of a challenge to them. And I think we should challenge you, you know, to be a missionary or to be a pastor, to be a pastor's wife, to be whatever it is that the Lord wants you to be in full-time ministry if that's what his desire is. But this passage is clear that young people shouldn't be the only ones that are challenged. The Lord Jesus has the right at any time to come into your life as a follower of him and do what he did with Peter. You might be comfortable in your career track. You might be a recognized expert in your field. You might be serving God at your workplace, but Jesus has the right to call you to a career change whenever he wants to. And my question to you this morning is, will you follow Peter's example and leave what is comfortable to follow the Lord if that's what he wants you to do? I'm not saying that's what he's doing, but he might be. What if he comes to you today or in the next weeks and makes it very apparent? And you're not 14. You're 44. What are you going to do? Will you have the same response as Peter? You just leave it all and follow Jesus? In the fall of 2019, uh, Don, Joanne, and I spent several months on the West Coast uh, visiting, supporting churches. And while we were there, we lived um, with my parents in the house with them. And, of course, you learn a lot about what's going on when you live with somebody than just by phone calls, you know. So we started seeing that mom and dad, they're doing fine. They're independent. Um, but... In the not-too-distant future, they're going to need some assistance. That became very apparent to us. And when we visited churches in 2019, this was the message I was preaching. You know, I was preaching it to everybody else. And I didn't realize that God led me to this passage because he was going to call us to a major change in life. But one morning while I was out walking and praying, the Holy Spirit applied this message to me in a very clear way. And I knew that God wanted me to live, leave Brazil, to be near my parents and available for whatever new ministry he has in mind. And I'm like, oh, brother, what's Don going to think about this? <laughs> But you know what? He'd been working in her heart, too. God does this. And she said, yeah, I know. God walked into our comfortable lives of serving in Rio, and he said, follow me. Leave all that's familiar to you, all that you love so much, and follow me. And it's been hard. Brazil's home. I mean, we love the United States, but I've lived in Brazil all my, well, more years in Brazil than here. My closest friends are there. Um, I had a lot of conversations with God and said, really, God? 
this really what you're asking us to do? I knew that. <laughs> when God speaks, you know. You know that God's speaking to you. But I thought maybe he can change his mind. But he wasn't changing his mind. But he has that right. Just as he had the right, you know, 30 years ago to call me out of what I thought was going to be a grand life, you know, of making Christian films and completely change my direction to be a missionary in Brazil. He has that right to walk in again and say, I've got something different now I want you to do. And I look at Peter, and, and something comforts me here, because when Jesus called Peter, he didn't give him a detailed look at the future. You know, he didn't say, Peter, come here, sit down, let me show you what's going to happen in the next 20 years. You're going to be a leader of the church, and you're going to write two letters that are going to last forever. They're going to be part of the very word of God. Peter doesn't know any of that. And Jesus doesn't give him any of that at this point. He just says, follow me. And when God made it clear that he wanted us to leave Brazil, he didn't give us anything. We weren't offered a new ministry into which we could just seamlessly move. I really prayed for that. I said, Lord, it'd be really nice to, you know, make this seamless transition from Brazil to whatever ministry. But it hasn't materialized yet. We, don't, we still don't know exactly what God wants us to do. But he just wanted us to take the first step, which we did. And as we follow him, we're confident that he's going to lead us into what he's got planned at the right time. So I just ask you to pray as a, on the side that we just follow with trusting hearts and not fret about it, but rest in the knowledge that he's good and he knows what's best. He always knows what's best. So how about you? Maybe you are a young person looking out on the broad horizon of what am I going to do with my life? Well, then I challenge you. Like Don said, um, you know, our mission board, and it's really across the board as we talk with other missionaries, we're seeing a very, dra a very dramatic decrease in the amount of young people going to the mission field and career missions. And so we challenge you with that. Uh, I have no doubt and I'm seeing it that, and, and even historically, God is going to send people from somewhere. You know, and, and we see a missionary fervor in South America. I think future years, uh, South America and, and Asia are going to be the points that God is using. God's work is going to go forward. That's not going to stop. But you could be a part of it. And if God is working in your life and, and calling you to be a, in full-time ministry, then don't put the brakes on just because you don't know what that's going to look like. God's dreams for you are so much better than your dreams for yourself. But maybe you're already established in your career. Maybe you're 45, maybe you're 56 like me. Are you willing to leave the comfort of the known to serve the Lord in the unknown if he so desires? You know, Jesus deserves unlimited access to all the stuff we have. But he also deserves our unlimited loving obedience when he calls us to do his will, even if that means leaving everything that's familiar, everything that we know, to go into the great unknown. But he's with us. He doesn't send us. You know, he goes with us wherever he's going to guide us. So let's determine to daily follow him wherever he might lead us because he's worthy. He's worthy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are indeed, as the psalmist said, a good God who only does good. There are times in our lives, Lord, when we don't feel like it's good and it hurts. And we forget the, the ultimate goals toward which you're driving towards in creating the, the beauty of Jesus Christ in us. But I'm so thankful, Lord, that we can rest in the knowledge that when you call us to do these kind of difficult things like you, like you did with Peter, 
You're not shoving us out into the, into the unknown. You're leading us. We're never alone. You're always with us. And what you have prepared up ahead, even though there might be obstacles, even though there might be pain involved, is so wonderful and amazing just to be a part of all that you're doing to bring glory to yourself. I pray, Lord, that you'd work in all of our hearts this morning, make us willing, even, even if you're not stepping into our lives today, to this kind of radical change in, in life, that you might encounter in us uh, daily hearts that are willing to be moved by, by your Holy Spirit to do this or that. But I pray to you that you make us willing and open so that if you were to walk into our lives like Jesus did into Peter's, we would have the same kind of response that Peter had because you're worthy. We thank you in Jesus' name.